okay? The live stream doesn't work now. For some reason. Okay. So maybe we will start without live streaming. Uh, uh, maybe maybe I can try. So how how do you do that? Or maybe we can just record it on Zoom and then yeah, upload it to YouTube. Yeah, 70 more people in the waiting room. I'm, I'm introducing all of them. Okay, yeah, numbers go up now massively. <clears throat> okay, let's just start because it's already uh, 10 minutes after the hour. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am sorry about the error that we had with the, uh, with the link. I hope that uh, most of the people who wanted to connect will be able to connect. We already have 275 participants, so it's, an, it's a nice turnaround. Um, Today we have with us uh, uh, Louis K uh, in this lecture. Uh, but before introducing Louis, I would like to say a few words about the, uh, the mechanics of the seminar. So I ask all of you to keep your uh, microphone mute during the talk uh, so that uh, we don't have any uh, <clears throat> spurious noises. Uh, but if you have a question, Please use the chat um, and just write the question. In the end of the talk, I will uh, turn to you one by one and ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question. And we will have a, a question and answer uh, session as, uh, as long as we have uh, questions. We don't have any limit of time unless Luis wants to go to sleep. Uh, so we will continue uh, hopefully with all the lectures. Uh, all the uh, questions. Okay, I just want to mention also that uh, in two weeks, we are going to have a lecture by Martin Grubele and you're all invited. And uh, please try to join us as well uh, in two weeks. So with that, I will uh, start uh, introducing Luis. So um, Luis K is for me, the embodiment of protein dynamics. Uh, he's really made enormous contributions to protein uh, dynamics, both by developing a uh, state-of-the-art methodology for magnetic resonance spectroscopy and by using it in order to, um, to perform uh, wonderful experiments on protein machi machines, on protein folding problems, and many other protein-related uh, experiments, uh, which uh, really put him at the frontier of the field of both protein folding and protein uh, dynamics for many, many years now. Uh, Louis started his career uh, with a PhD at Yale and then did his postdoc with Adbox at the NIH and moved to University of Toronto where he's been for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, as I said, his work has, uh, has been at the forefront of uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy and one of the wonderful things about uh, Louis is that 
he can just as well give you a lecture, uh, a deep fundamental lecture about magnetic resonance uh, theory, and also a lecture about how to use magnetic resonance to learn about protein dynamics, which is what I believe he's going to do today. Uh, Lewis received many accolades for his uh, excellent work over the years. And I will just mention that just uh, about a month ago, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences of the US. Um, today's lecture is about the important role of dynamics in the function and misfunction of molecular machines. And with that, I will give the microphone to Luis. So please, I'm, I'm stopping sharing your, my screen and please start sharing yours. Okay, can you both see the screen and hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for that wonderful introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. What I would like to do is speak about the importance of uh, protein dynamics in health and disease. And in particular, I wanna talk about the dynamics of a molecular machine, uh, P97, which is involved in cellular proteostasis and tell you a little bit about how the dynamics change uh, when one has a, a wild type molecule or a mutated molecule. And when I talk about molecular machines, I'm talking about large uh, macromolecules with aggregate molecular weights on the order of many hundreds of kilodaltons upwards of a megadalton. And if there's one thing to take from this lecture, the most important thing being that now with NMR spectroscopy, we can begin to study in quantitative detail aspects about dynamics of these very large particles. I also want to emphasize the important role in physics of physics in all of this. Typically, we uh, recognize the fact that physics is fundamental to everything that we do, but we focus on the biology. And today I thought it would be important also to give you a taste of the physics because without the physics, I couldn't be giving uh, this lecture at all. So if I can just uh, advance my slides, yes. The first thing that we have to do as NMR spectroscopists is decide how we want to label our molecules to study them. And what I show here is a small uh, protein domain, a sarcomology 2 domain. The backbone uh, is indicated in uh, blue here. And then these white balls correspond to hydrogens or protons in the protein. And these white balls are nothing more than little bar magnets that give off magnetic fields that are then uh, detected by our very expensive uh, spectrometers. And having many of these hydrogens is a good thing because we have many probes of structure and dynamics, which is what we need if we want to get a, a detailed uh, picture of what's going on. But it turns out that as we go to higher molecular weight systems, having too much of a good thing is in fact a bad thing. And if we focus, for example, on the signal that emanates from this white ball here, by virtue of the fact that it's close to other white balls, which are nothing more, again, than little bar magnets giving off magnetic fields, these magnetic fields are going to essentially, if you like, interfere with the signal of interest and restore it back to the equilibrium position. And in NMR, the equilibrium position is no signal. And the efficacy by which the uh, no signal situation uh, arises increases uh, rather significantly uh, with molecular weight. And so what we and others have done over the years is simply to uh, get rid of these white balls, to get rid of the hydrogens, and to replace uh, the uh, white balls with deuterons. Now, deuterons are also uh, little bar magnets, but they're one-seventh the intensity of a proton bar magnet. And so the effect of restoring the magnetization back to its equilibrium, no signal situation, is much reduced. And then we have to add protons back into the system so that we can study it. And we've chosen to add protons back in, in the form of methyl groups, methyl groups being C13H3 moieties, and that's indicated here in magenta. So these are the isoleucine, leucine, and valine methyl groups in this little SH2 domain that we're gonna use as probes of structure and dynamics. Now, if we wanna then take our protein and dissolve it uh, in H2O, we can look at the backbone amide protons as well, but for the applications that we wanna consider, which are to very high molecular weight systems, these amide protons are not going to be terribly useful. So we're gonna rely on a methyl groups as probes of structural dynamics in the systems that we wanna focus on. So how do we go about doing that? Well, nowadays it's very easy to prepare highly deuterated methyl protonated uh, proteins. In the early days, it wasn't so uh, easy to do it. We had to essentially generate the precursors ourselves Nowadays, one can buy the precursors, for example, alpha-ketobutyric acid, 
where the methyl group is C13H3 and other positions are deuterated. That's a precursor for isoleucine. And uh, isovalerate is a precursor for valine and leucine, where one of the methyls is going to be uh, C13H3, and uh, the other methyl is going to be C12D3. The C12D3 methyl group is going to be invisible. And then we add these precursors about an hour prior to the uh, uh, overproduction of our protein. And at the end of the day, we end up with proteins that are highly deuterated, highly deuterated because we're growing them in media, which is uh, highly deuterated, and protonated at the level of methyl group. So what I show here is a carbon proton two-dimensional NMR spectrum where each of these dots corresponds to a methyl group. And then the name of the game is to assign each of these methyl groups to specific sites in the protein. For example, this methyl group uh, over here may be due to isoleucine 12. So we want to assign all of the methyl groups to specific sites of the protein in the protein because then they can serve as probes of structure and dynamics. And in the case of malate synthase G, back in the day, this was a large system, 80 kilodalton, 700 residues. We developed methodology which allowed us to assign something like 95% of the methyls to specific sites in the protein as the first step towards addressing uh, questions of biological interest. So this is how we deal with proteins where we want uh, methyl labels. How about uh, other biomolecules? Well, we've recently developed uh, NMR approaches to look at big nucleic acids. Uh, they involve uh, methyl groups. And here what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of what Mother Nature has taught us. In the case of uh, prokaryotic systems, Mother Nature uses a system that involves methyl transferases and restriction endonucleases. These methyl transferases are going to specifically add methyl groups to uh, regions of the, the DNA in this particular case, and that ensures that the restriction endonucleases of the hosts are not able to cleave the DNA. So the methyl groups act as a protective uh, measure against cleavage. By contrast, uh, if you have a bacterial system that is invaded by a bacteriophage or other bacteria, presumably these would not be methylated at the appropriate positions, and restriction endonuclease would then uh, chop them up. Of course, in eukaryotic systems, uh, uh, methyls are going to be added to DNA and to RNA uh, as epigenetic uh, important biological markers. So we're going to use the approach that Mother Nature has taken. We're going to uh, provide a precursor for methyl group C13H3 methionine. We're going to add ATP, S-adenosyl methionine synthase, which we produce the enzyme, which is going to produce SAM, shown here. And that's going to be a precursor, along with the DNA that we add into a one-pot reaction, uh, plus a variety of different methyl transferases, which are going to add the methyl group to the various positions in the DNA that we want. So that we can produce DNA, high molecular weight DNA, that is going to be methyl labeled. And then we can generate uh, our molecule of interest, in this case, a nucleosome core particle, which is going to be methyl labeled both at the level of the protein component, in fact, in this particular case at histone H2B, this is the red protein component here. There's four different components. H2B is one of them that is labeled in this case. And here are the peaks from H2B. And then we've labeled the DNA corresponding to these black balls on the DNA. And you can see the positions of the DNA labels uh, in the spectrum shown here. They're well resolved, the red and the blue peaks, which means that we can look at the, uh, both the DNA at the same time that we look at proteins. And we can begin to ask questions about the dynamics and the breathing of the nucleosome core particle uh, using solution-based uh, NMR approaches. So now that we have uh, the label of interest that we want, namely methyl groups, can we design the appropriate spin physics which is going to allow us to exploit uh, this labeling technology? And NMR spectroscopists, of course, like to have very large magnetic fields of a gigahertz or 1.2 gigahertz. But it turns out that our success is dictated also by what we do with the small fields. The very small fields are manifest by virtue of the fact that the spin spy probes of molecular structure and dynamics are these little bar magnets. Here I show a pair of them, a hydrogen bar magnet and a carbon magnet bar magnet. This is the large magnetic field in red that we spend uh, millions of dollars on. And then what I've drawn are lines of magnetic flux that emanate from the hydrogen and are felt by the carbon. Now this CH uh, entity is going to be attached to a macromolecule. The macromolecule is going to be tumbling. The CH bond vector is also going to be uh, moving due to internal dynamics. 
And so as a function of time, the flux lines you can see here versus here are going to change. There's going to be changes in magnetic field, and it's these fluctuating magnetic fields that this carbon in this particular case sees that give rise to what we call spin relaxation, the process by which the signal of interest is going to be restored to the equilibrium no signal position. So we have to somehow manipulate these lines of flux in a way that will ensure uh, the uh, longevity of the signals of interest. And let me just take you very, very briefly and simply through a little bit of the spin physics uh, in a way that I think that people should be able to understand if they've taken a basic course in organic chemistry. So let's start with a small molecule, a small organic molecule that tumbles very rapidly in solution. And suppose that that organic molecule has a CH2 moiety. And suppose further that we record a carbon spectrum. So the carbon spectrum would give rise to a one to two to one triplet. This is the carbon spectrum. There are three lines. And there are three lines because the carbon is attached to two protons. These are little bar magnets, and they can be both oriented against the magnetic field, along the magnetic field, or one can be oriented against and one along the magnetic field. And there's two possible ways of doing that, hence the one to two to one triplet structure. Let's now suppose that that methylene group is attached not to a small molecule, but to a very large molecule that tumbles very slowly. And we'll assume that the methylene group is rigid in the sense that while it tumbles with the overall big molecule to which it's attached, there's no internal dynamics. Then one can show via a back of the envelope calculation that one ends up with a triplet, but now the intensities of the lines are all the same, and the middle line is going to be twice fatter than the outer lines. By contrast, if we have a methylene group that is highly mobile, say one that's attached to a fatty acid, where the fatty acid is gonna rotate very rapidly about an axis system which is perpendicular to uh, the uh, plane of the bilayer, such that each of the two carbon proton bond vectors have equal projections along the averaging axis, then one gets a spectrum that looks something like this for the methylene. The lines are much more narrow, but in particular, I wanna draw your attention to this middle line here, which is infinitely narrow. Essentially, the signal from it has been immortalized if we only consider the magnetic interactions that manifest in this CH2 uh, methylene group. So this is a very good situation, but the problem is that methyl groups or methylene groups attached to proteins or nucleic acids do not have these sort of uh, mobility uh, attributes that one would typically find for a CH2 group in a fatty acid that is rotating very rapidly about its long axis. So the question is what to do? Well, let's come back to the methyl groups. Methyl groups are actually uh, very good moieties in the sense that they have this very rapid rotation about an averaging axis. So like a methylene group in a fatty acid that rotates very rapidly about an averaging axis, methyl groups have the same situation. For example, here's a methyl group attached to a carbon on an amino acid, and there's very rapid rotation about the carbon-carbon bond, typically on the order of a few uh, picoseconds. But the problem is a methyl group is not a methylene group, and so the spin physics is a little bit different. So we as spectroscopists have to somehow convince the methyl group that it's really a methylene. So how do we convince a methyl group that it's really a methylene? Well, the answer is quantum mechanics. So what does that mean? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a super spin. The super spin is gonna com be comprised of a carbon shown here, that's the methyl carbon, and one of the three protons indicated in red. So we have an interaction between the carbon and one of the three protons. The other two protons are going to be outside this super spin. So if we liken this super carbon hydrogen spin to the carbon spin of a CH2 group, where we have two protons on the outside in a carbon spectrum, here we have two protons looking from the outside in the case of this super spin spectrum. The spin physics is in fact analogous in that case and we can get a very narrow central line in the context of a methyl group, which allows us to record spectra of very high molecular weight systems. So that for example, in a typical NMR experiment, if we didn't do anything fancy, but focused on a methyl group, uh, what we would see is a function of increasing molecular weight, molecular weight increases along an axis, which moves to the right, the uh, peaks would get smaller and smaller, broader and broader, and eventually just melt into the noise. 
By contrast, if we use a technology which we've termed methyl trozy NMR, then the uh, peaks as a function of increasing molecular weight decrease much more slowly. And as a function, we can look at much larger systems and learn something about the, their biology. So it's really the physics that has pioneered the biology and has allowed us, for example, to look at uh, proteins such as P97. P97 is a molecular machine. It has a molecular weight on the order of, say, 600 kilodaltons. It's involved in a large number of different biological processes, uh, which can be uh, grouped under uh, proteostasis, so maintaining healthy levels of protein uh, in the cell. P97 is involved in a large number of uh, functions, as I mentioned. Uh, these functions, for example, involve segregation of proteins uh, from large proteinaceous complexes, such as those that are involved in nucleic acid repair and replication. After the uh, repair is done, you've got to essentially stop it. And the way that a P97 does this is by pulling out proteins uh, from the large uh, system that is involved in repair. P97 can also pull out proteins that are damaged from biological membranes. They can be ER or mitochondria-based uh, membranes. And P97 is also involved uh, with membranes in a membrane assembly after you have uh, cells that divide into daughter cells the Golgi membranes uh, have to be reassembled into their uh, normal functional structures, and P97 plays a role in that. P97 is also involved in uh, degradation of proteins, both proteasomal uh, degradation and non-proteasomal lysosomal uh, pathways. And it's, in fact, the lysosomal pathway that I want to speak to you about today because we're going to talk about disease mutants that impair this pathway. They don't impair other pathways, but they impair the lysosomal a degradation pathway. P97 is an ATPase. It uses ATP to power its function. It's a very abundant protein, something like one or two percent of the cellular protein is P97. Now the importance of P97 is underscored by the large number of both biological papers that have appeared in the literature and also structure, structural biological papers. And I show here an example of some of the work that's been done via crystallography that have uh, essentially established uh, the structures of these uh, uh, wonderful uh, machines. So in the wild type form, uh, P97 is uh, homohexameric. It's comprised of six copies of a polypeptide chain that is 800 residues. The polypeptide chain in turn is comprised of an N-terminal domain, and then a pair of uh, nucleotide binding domains, D1 and D2, they're arranged in a double donut structure. So you have the D1 donut on the top and then the D2 donut on the bottom. And then in the ADP form, the N-terminal domains are gonna be coplanar with the D1 ring. So this is the ADP form. There's also an ATP form, and that's uh, indicated here, where the N-terminal domains are going to be above the plane of the D1 ring. It turns out that one can work with smaller versions of P97, a version where the second donut is going to be cut off. So we have just the NTD and the D1, and then a small linker between D1 and D2. And those are the single donut structures that you see here that we're uh, going to work with primarily uh, uh, for what I want to tell you about. But the bottom line is that there are two uh, types of orientations of the N-terminal domains in the context of wild type healthy protein. In the ADP form, these N-terminal domains are going to be down, and I'll indicate that by this schematic where I show only one of the N-terminal domains and the linker. And then in the ATP form where the N-terminal domain is going to be up. If we rotate these molecules by 90 degrees, you can see the beautiful uh, hexameric structure. Now these up-down uh, orientations of the N-terminal domains, these blue balls, are thought to be very important. These N-terminal domains are going to bind various molecules, adapter molecules, which regulate the function of uh, P97. And the affinity for the adapter molecules is going to vary depending on the orientation of these N-terminal domains. So the up-down equilibrium that is associated with the nucleotide uh, state is going to be uh, critical for function. Now, P97 is implicated in disease. And what I show here, again, starting with the hexameric structure, if we focus on this rectangular region uh, here and blow it up, you can see the N-terminal domain, you can see the D1 domain, the nucleotide, and then in yellow, highlighted are a number of positions where one has 
uh, mutations to give rise to a series of diseases which are called multi-system proteinopathy-based diseases. These are diseases that essentially affect cognition, they affect, affect musculature, uh, and they also affect bone structure. And all of these uh, diseases are associated uh, primarily with lysosomal degradation, that is to say, with this pathway here. So our approach is going to be to take the labeling methodologies that we've developed, we're going to take the spin physics that we've developed, and we're going to use these to study how disease mutants are able to modulate the function of P97. And we're going to take advantage of the fact that we can work with a single uh, P97 uh, donut structure, a 320 kilodon uh, construct, still quite big. And of course, if we find something that's interesting, then we'll uh, verify it on the uh, larger 540 kilodon uh, intact structure. The first thing that we have to establish is that we get nice spectra. Of course, this is our bread and butter. Uh, and here is a spectrum of uh, P97 in the ADP state, the carbon proton correlation map where each one of these dots, something like 97% of them, have been assigned to specific isoleucines, leucines, valines, and the thionines in the context of the overall structure of the molecule. And we have about 80 or 90% of the assignments for the ATP state uh, as well. So we have a large number of probes of molecular structure and dynamics. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why should we bother with NMR? And the answer is that whilst this a particular uh, protein has been studied by other biophysical methods, it's at least my opinion, that they don't really provide strong correlations between disease, disease severity and changes to structure or nucleotide binding or hydrolysis. Yes, there are changes between disease and wild type, but it would be difficult to correlate those changes with disease severity. You can't say, well, this is a very severe disease uh, mutation, and look, the, the binding properties are just way off relative to a moderate disease mutation. That appears not to be the case. And so we thought that it might be interesting to see if NMR could perhaps address uh, the severity uh, uh, relationship that exists in terms of some biophysical property, uh, some structural property or dynamic property. And so initially what we did is we do some comparative experiments. We looked at the R95G, very severe disease mutant, or the wild type in blue and black respectively, and bound to a slowly hydrolyzing uh, ATP analog called ATP gamma S. We record spectra of the two and they are superimposed as indicated here. And you can see that wherever there's a black peak, there's also going to be a blue peak. So the uh, nature of the spectra are identical. And so what that means is that so too are the conformations. Remember the wild type conformation in the ATP state has the N-terminal domains in the up conformation so too, therefore, they must be for R95G, this very severe disease mutant, in the ATP form. And then we looked at the situation in the ADP state, and here we saw something that was really quite different. This is a complicated slide, so let me just take you uh, through it. What I've done is I've superimposed something like seven or eight spectra. So everywhere where you see a red color, uh, that's one spectra. A yellow would be a different spectra, and so forth. And then what I show here, this is isoleucine 189, the methyl group, the delta-1 methyl group, for a bunch of isoleucine 189s, each, of course, in a different context. For example, the red peak corresponds to isoleucine 189 in the context of the wild-type ADP form. The black peak corresponds to the same isoleucine in the context of the wild-type ATP form. So the ADP form is NTDs down, the ATP form is NTDs up, and you can clearly see that there's a very large signature for isoleucine 189 and also for different isoleucines and valine. We have something like 20 peaks that, that really show this very large uh, signature. And then what I show here in the middle in the different colors are going to be different P97s. These are mutated P97s in the ADP form. Now remember the ADP state is supposed to be the all down state insofar as the NTDs are concerned. Uh, but what we see here is a titration of uh, peaks from yellow all the way up to purple. And this is in order of a disease severity, it turns out. This uh, yellow peak, which is from uh, an ASIN 387 to a histidine uh, mutation, is a fairly uh, moderate disease mutation. By contrast, R95G 
the peak show, and here's a very severe disease mutation. So as a function of disease severity, you can see that the up-down equilibrium is shifting. As we move progressively towards the black peak, that's the all-up state, the red peak is the all-down state. So despite the fact that these mutants are associated with the ADP form, which is supposed to be, in the wild-type case at least, is the down state, this equilibrium is becoming aberrant as a function of disease mutation. So let me just uh, put that in the context of a little bit of an NMR lesson. Again, I mentioned that this is the uh, peak from the down state, the peak from the up state. And then as a function of disease mutants, uh, we get a uh, linear titration of peaks. So what does that actually mean? Well, the simplest explanation is if we have exchange between two conformations, the down conformation, which is the wild type ADP-like conformation, the up conformation, which is the wild type ATP-like conformation, and suppose we have a methyl group probe like that associated with isoleucine-189. Now, isoleucine-189 in the down state and the up state have different peak positions. But if we have very rapid rotation or very rapid interconversion between the two states, and we know that the interconversion between up and down is in excess of 15,000 per second, based on some of the NMR experiments that we've done, then we end up with an average. So the methyl peak essentially has frequencies, resonance positions that are an average, a population weighted average of the down and the up states. So what we can do is as we see these peaks here, we know that they are blends, if you like, of the down or the up state and the relative amount of blending is given by the position of the peak in relation to the all down or all up states. So simply by knowing the chemical shifts, we can read off the populations of up and down. That is to say we can get the equilibrium uh, constant that relates to this uh, up down uh, equilibrium for the NTDs. So to summarize uh, here, what we have is the following situation. In the ADP state, and I will be talking about the ADP state uh, throughout, in the wild type uh, configuration, we have uh, all down indicated here, but as a function of disease mutation, the equilibrium is going to be shifted towards uh, the up state uh, as indicated uh, here. I mentioned that P97 is involved in a plethora of different activities. So the question is, how does this aberrant up-down equilibrium affect the downstream activities of P97. We think we may understand some of the biophysics of the disease mutation, but how about the biology? Well, P97 is able to carry out its myriad of functions by virtue of the fact that it interacts with a myriad uh, number of adapters, a large number of adapters. Binding of adapters to P97 are going to direct P97 to specific functions in the cell, to specific regions in the cell, and there's a particular adapter that is going to cause P97 to be involved in lysosomal degradation. And so we want to study the interaction of that adapter with P97, both in the wild type ADP form and in various disease mutants of varying disease severity to try to understand how the interaction may be uh, modified by uh, disease. So what we have is as follows. The adapter is called UBXD1. And we're going to look at an N-terminal 133 residue fragment of UBXD1 called UBXD1N. Now, this fragment has uh, two regions that are of interest, a VIM region and an H1H2 region. They're small IDRs, and they are going to uh, bind in a uh, double-pronged uh, mechanism to uh, P97. And we know that because from NMR, we have a large number of probes. And so we can determine something about uh, each of the uh, microscopic uh, binding events. So we have this yellow VIM domain, and the yellow VIM domain is going to bind to the N-terminal domain. So there's a yellow-blue interaction, and then there's going to be an interaction with this purple uh, moiety, and that interaction occurs at the level of the interface between the uh, N-terminal domain in blue and the D1 domain in gray. So it's going to snuggle in the interface and isoleucine 146 and 189 are going to report on this second prong interaction. The first prong interaction is reported by uh, valine 68. So if we look at a carbon proton two-dimensional spectrum, and if we record the spectrum in the absence of UBXD1N, that's the red spectrum that we get. And then the gray spectrum is what we get when we add UBXD1N. 
So you can see that valine 68, which reports on the interaction between yellow and blue, shows a significant chemical shift change that is associated uh, with binding. Isoleucine 189 and isoleucine 146, which report on the second prong of the interaction, which in turn is related to the up-down equilibrium, isoleucine 189 and 146 are up-down equilibrium probes. They show small differences between the free form of P97 and the form of P97 that is bound in the, for the wild type uh, ADP case. And the reason why there's only a small difference is because recall that in the wild type form, the ADP form, uh, we have a situation where the N-terminal domains are already going to be down. So if we then bind UBXD1, that just forms a lockdown configuration, but it's essentially very similar in structure. So we have very little changes uh, in the red to gray for these two reporters of the second prong. Now, one of the nice things about NMR spectroscopy is one can get insights into function by doing these very simple experiments. So what I've done here is I've looked at the hexameric structure and I've isolated a rectangle uh, element here and blown it up. And I've then painted on the P97 structure regions uh, that correspond to binding of either the VIM domain in yellow or H1, H2 in purple. So the yellow uh, region indicates where VIM binds. It binds to the N-terminal domain. And the H1, H2 motif binds to the interface between the N-terminal domain and D1. So in the wild type form of the protein in the down state, there's a large interface uh, that is uh, generated, as you can see schematically here. But as a function of disease mutants, when this N-terminal domain moves progressively upwards, the interface is going to be destroyed, which means that the interaction we would postulate involving H1, H2, which is the second prong interaction, should be a severely compromised, severely impaired for uh, the disease mutations. That's a hypothesis. We want to test that. And so we've now done the same experiment, but as a function of disease mutant severity. So what I show here is in the context of the wild type protein. This is what I uh, described to you on the previous slide. Let's now look at R155H or N387H. These are moderate disease mutants. And then R95G and R155P are very severe disease mutants. So for these moderate disease mutations, what happens? Well, if we focus on R155H, and we record a spectrum, again, in the absence of UBXD1 for a moment, we get this orange spectrum indicated here. And then in the presence of UBXD1, we get the black peaks that are indicated here. And then the gray peaks are the peaks that we would get if we were doing the wild type experiment. That's the experiment on the far left here. So they're just uh, here to essentially guide the eye to remind you what a wild type scenario would be like. So we can tell from valine 68, which reports on yellow binding to blue, that the binding interaction is incomplete. It does occur, yellow moves to black, but it's not as far a movement as would be the case for the wild type protein. And a similar scenario occurs for isoleucine 189 and isoleucine 146. So we have impaired binding. The situation for R95G, which is a very severe disease mutant, is indicated here. Again, Blue now corresponds to the APO form. Black again corresponds to the form in the presence of UBXD1N. And these gray peaks are meant to show what the wild type scenario would be like. So valine 68 indicates that the yellow blue interaction is still happening because the blue peak is moving to this black uh, position here. But if we look at the blue and the black peaks for isoleucine 189 and isoleucine 146, they're superimposed. There's absolutely no change in the up-down equilibrium, therefore, as reported by isoleucine 189 and 146 upon binding of UBXD1. So what that means is as follows. As a function of disease mutation, we impair the second prong of the interaction. That's the prong that involves H1H2. It still happens to some extent for the moderate disease mutants, but for the very severe disease mutant, there's absolutely no indication that there's an interaction that involves H1H2 uh, with the uh, D1 domain. So as a function of disease severity, we're certainly uh, affecting the binding of the downstream uh, target, the UBXD1 adapter. Now we know from a variety of different experiments, and I won't speak about these uh, at all today, 
that P97 is a very mushy, a squishy uh, a protein. We have the up-down equilibrium, but we also have millisecond time scale dynamics, which we can measure uh, with uh, atomic resolution detail. And so we thought, well, maybe we could exploit the squishiness of P97 to try to restore it back to its um, wild type nature when we're dealing with the disease mutant. Suppose we have the following situation. Let's suppose that we have a very severe disease mutant. And that's indicated here at position 155, arginine is the wild type uh, amino acid, but if it's mutated to cysteine or proline, it forms a very severe disease mutation. We ask the following question, are there amino acids in the vicinity of position 155 in the down state that are far away in the up state so that if we perturb one of those amino acids, say mutate an amino acid that is proximal to the business end where the mutation occurs, perhaps we could stabilize the down state without affecting the up state and in so doing shift the aberrant equilibrium back to the down position, the wild type position in this disease mutant and therefore restore binding. And so this is essentially what we've done. We're gonna focus again on isoleucine 189 and just to orient you again, this black peak is from a spectrum that we recorded in the ATP state of the wild type enzyme. And the corresponding ADP uh, spectrum is shown for the wild type uh, enzyme is shown down here in red. When we record an experiment on the R155C, very severe disease mutant, where the up-down equilibrium is roughly 50-50, we end up with the blue peak for isoleucine 189. And then if we introduce a mutation at position 387, which is proximal to position 185, we replace this acin with a cysteine, the blue peak goes away and becomes this orange peak indicated here. So you can see that the peak has moved all the way down towards the wild type. So we've restored the up-down equilibrium to a wild type or near wild type situation. And while I won't show you the primary data today, suffice it to say that we also restore wild type binding of UBXD1. So we can play games with the inherent plasticity of P97 to try to revert the uh, function to that of a wild type. Now, it turns out that the diseases that I've been talking about are autosomal dominant. And so what that means is that if you have in your two alleles copies for the disease mutant in both cases, so your homozygous for the mutant, then you are not viable. So you are not going to uh, survive in utero. So anybody who has uh, this set of diseases has one copy of the wild type allele and one copy of the disease mutant. And in vivo work that we've done, but actually uh, others have done uh, long before us, establishes that the P97 particles that are produced when one has one copy of wild type and one copy of a disease mutant are not going to be uh, all wild type, say, or all mutant, but are going to be mixtures of wild type and mutant protomers. So that what we should really be asking is not what happens if we have six copies of our disease mutant, one in every uh, protomer associated with a particle, but when we have mixtures of disease and wild type protomers. What then happens? So what would be the effect of having a mixed P97 uh, particle where we have both wild type and disease mutant containing protomers? So let me just review uh, what we've done to this point. We have a situation where we've made P97 molecules where every one of the protomers is going to be red, R95G disease mutant, or every one of the protomers is going to be blue, R95G, and T62A, double disease mutants. And we have determined on the basis of the positions of the peaks in relation to all down, wild type ADP, or all up, wild type ATP, we've determined what the fraction of up uh, configurations is going to be for a given NTD. But now we wanna do a different experiment. We wanna do a mixing experiment. So we're going to take our white particles and we're going to take our red particles, we're going to unfold them, and then we're going to refold them. And we're going to be able to control to a large extent how many red particles we have or how many red protomers we have in the context of white protomers for a given particle simply by controlling how much of all white and how much of all red we mix. And moreover, we're going to do an experiment which is sort of nifty and is really, I speak, think, speaks to the power of NMR we're gonna make all of the white 
protomers, NMR invisible. They're going to be deuterated. And all of the red protomers are going to be NMR visible. They're going to be deuterated, except the methyl groups are going to be C13H3, which means that once we've generated P97s that look like this, we can ask questions about how the up-down equilibrium of this red protomer is going to be affected by the uh, presence of the white protomers. And again, we're simply going to record uh, very straightforward NMR spectra, focusing in this particular uh, example, again, on isoleucine-189. And we're going to uh, make samples where the R95G disease mutant is going to be one particle, or one, if you like, one protomer. The other protomers are going to be invisible, and they're going to be different. For example, in the case of R95G, in a wild-type ring, we don't see the wild-type protomers. We just see R95G, because it's labeled, and it's roughly 27% up. So the up-down equilibrium, which would normally be in a homohexameric R95G disease mutant, where every one of the protomers, therefore, is going to be R95G, in this particular case, where we have 47% there, we now have 27% where the neighbors are going to be wild type. Conversely, when the neighbors are going to be even more up-like than the R95G disease mutant, the R95G also assumes a more up-like conformation. So this R95G very severe disease mutant is going to be affected uh, by the neighbors. It's going to be a slave to the neighbors so long as the neighbors are, of course, either mostly down uh, or mostly up. So you have a situation where you have a level of cooperativity. Now, we've done an experiment where we're looking at the R95G disease mutants. Remember the R95G disease mutant, and in fact, all of the uh, disease mutants to various uh, uh, levels of efficacy are going to destroy the interactions that exist at the level of the NTD and D1. So as a consequence, the intra-interactions that would normally exist and stabilize the position of the NTD are going to be destroyed. And the NTD, therefore, is going to be influenced by what its neighbors, the neighbor protomers, are doing. By contrast, if we do the reverse experiment, so now what we're going to do again is create a situation where we have just one labeled protomer in a sea of unlabeled protomers, but now the labeled protomer is going to be wild type. So wild type is shown here in gray. It's going to be ADP, all of the protomers are ADP bound, and the other protomers are going to be R95G, so severe disease mutant, or R95G plus T62A. So these blue and red protomers have a tendency to be very much up, but you can see that the wild type protomer is not affected at all all of the peaks superimpose exactly where the wild type uh, position is. Now, again, we're just looking at the gray peaks. We're just looking at the wild type protomers. So the neighbors there have no influence. And the reason for that is because in the down position, we have a strong interface, a strong intra-protomer interface. And therefore, what the other protomers are doing does not influence the up-down equilibrium. The wild type is going to uh, consistently uh, be down, irrespective of its neighbors. So building on that, we ask the question, how does one protomer sense what the next protomer is doing? And when we exploit the fact, we're going to exploit the fact that these wild type protomers are essentially independent entities because the intra interactions are so strong. So we're going to record a spectrum of the ADP form of the completely wild type form of a particle. And then we're going to do an experiment where we record a second spectrum, where we have the wild type particle, which is going to be NMR visible, in a sea of R95G particles, where we have an up-down equilibrium of roughly 50-50. And these R95Gs, these red particles, are going to be invisible. And we're going to look for differences in chemical shifts. Now, the differences in chemical shifts cannot come from differences in up-down equilibria, because the visible particle, the NMR visible particle, is going to be the wild type particle, and that's the all down particle. I showed you that on the last slide. So it must reflect interactions between R95G and the wild type, the communication between them, that does not have anything to do with the uh, up down equilibrium in the sense that 
there is only a down configuration, but would influence the up-down equilibrium if it could occur if we were dealing with some disease mutant here and not the wild type. So in other words, what we're going to be able to get out is a communication between these red protomers and this black protomer. It has no effect on the up-down equilibrium here because it's a wild type, but it would if we had a, a, a disease mutant uh, at the level of this black protomer. And what we see is as follows. If we focus on the uh, wild type protomer indicated here, and these red dots correspond, or the red balls correspond to amino acids in the uh, wild type protomer that are affected by the up-down equilibrium of the uh, R9G uh, neighboring protomer. So we think, therefore, that the communication between protomers happens by virtue of these residues. We have not mutated them uh, to prove it, but it can happen from uh, interaction between one protomer to the neighbors via these uh, red amino acids, which then influence potentially the up-down uh, equilibrium uh, of uh, the protomer of interest, the disease protomer of interest. Now, we thought it might be interesting, despite the fact that this is not terribly biological for reasons that I've indicated, to come back and look at the R95G homohexamer. So this is where every one of the protomers is going to be disease uh, mutated. And to ask the following question, is the up-down equilibrium in that case um, going to be uh, cooperative? In other words, does the up-down equilibrium of a given protomer, is that affected by uh, the neighbors? And for that, we decided to turn to uh, cryo-EM to try to address that question. Now, before that, I should say that when we have a hexameric uh, particle, so we have six NTDs where every NTD can be either up or down with roughly a 50-50 uh, probability in the case of the R95G homohexameric uh, situation. We know that from the bulk NMR measurements that we've uh, done. So therefore, there should be two to the six different uh, conformations uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the particle, corresponding to various up and down states. So 64 different configurations, but many of these configurations are degenerate. So there's in fact only 14 different conformations, okay? Many of the 64 are degenerate in the sense that one can rotate about the six-fold symmetry axis and go from one configuration uh, to uh, the next. These are the 14 non-degenerate states. Each one of these uh, balls here corresponds to an NTD, which is either white for up or a blue for down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take cryo-EM um, pictures, if you like, of our R95G homohexamer. We're going to get 200, 300, 400,000 images. And then we're going to classify the images as being derived from one of the 14 uh, different uh, states indicated here. So we now have images that are associated, say, with state A or state B or state C. And then we're going to combine these images to reconstruct uh, three-dimensional maps of the 14 uh, different states. So that, for example, this is a reconstruction for configuration E. Configuration E has two blue NTDs and four whites, so four NTDs that are up. And those are indicated here by the uh, orange NTDs and this 90 degree rotation, if we take a, a Z plane through uh, regions of density, which would be present in the ATP, but not the ADP case, and we look at uh, what we get that's shown here, uh, and you can see that there are four NTDs that are up. By contrast, for configuration I, there are going to be three NTDs that are going to be up. So we have 14 different uh, structures, but more important than that, by virtue of the fact that we've classified the individual 2D images as to being one of uh, 14 different uh, states, we know the populations of each of these states. And that's what's shown here, the fractional populations of each of the 14 different states. And so we ask, well, if we have this distribution of fractional populations, can we say something about uh, the nature of the cooperativity or the lack thereof of this up-down equilibrium? And so what we want to do is come up with a mathematical model whereby we can define fractional populations in terms of a limited number of parameters. And the three parameters are shown here, P0, P1, and P2. These are going to be conditional probabilities. So that, for example, P0, if we focus, if you can see this arrow here, so we focus on this uh, blue 
uh, circle here that corresponds to an NTD down. P0 is the probability that the NTD is going to be down given the fact that the two immediate neighboring NTDs are up. P2 is the probability that that NTD is going to be down given that the two neighboring NTDs are also down. And P1 corresponds to the situations where the probability is determined for a given NTD being down, given that one of the neighbors is down and the other is going to be up. Now it turns out that there's a relationship between P0, P1, and P2 in our model, so there's only two different fitting parameters, and we fit this histogram to a model which uh, essentially on the basis of P0 through P2 allows us to determine the fractional populations of every one of these 14 states, and from the fit, or from the fit, we can then uh, extract out P0, P1, and P2. So P0 through P2 are fitting parameters because those are the parameters that give us the fractional populations of each of these states. We fit those uh, to the uh, histogram indicated here. And what we uh, are able to establish is that all of the populations are, or all of the probabilities are going to be the same. So for the case of a homohexameric R95G dis G disease mutation, mutant, uh, the up-down uh, equilibria appears to be not cooperative. Every uh, NTD in the homohexameric case uh, is doing <coughs> its own thing. So let me come back to the uh, biologically interesting situation where we have a hexa uh, uh, case where the uh, various uh, N-terminal domains are either going to be associated with protomers that are wild type or disease, but in a given particle uh, we have a mixture. We've shown that fairly subtle uh, influences to the energy landscape can affect the up-down status and hence the binding of adapters. Uh, disease mutants respond to neighboring protomer up-down states so that if a disease mutant NTD is surrounded by protomers that are wild type, that pushes it into a down conformation, at least somewhat. But if it's surrounded by protomers that are up and more up than it would normally be, it pushes it into a a significantly more upstick. So we ask the following question. How does the presence of these uh, wild type protomers where we have a disease R95G protomer, how does that affect the binding properties of that R95G protomer? We sort of know the answer already because our model predicts that if we shift the equilibrium of the R95G up-down configuration to be more wild type like, and I've shown you that that's what uh, occurs in, in this particular uh, a situation where we have uh, neighbors that are wild type like, uh, then the idea would be if the equilibrium is more wild type, then the function, uh, the binding of, of ligand should also be more wild type like, as we saw uh, when we had that partially uh, revertent uh, mutant. And that's illustrated here. If we look at P97 binding to UBXD1, again, if we focus a situation uh, for the case where all of the R90, all of the protomers are R95G. And then we look at isoleucine 189 and 146. This is data that I've shown you already. The green peaks correspond to the absence of UBXD1, the purple peaks to the presence of UBXD1. And you can see that there's no uh, movement of uh, purple with respect to green. There's no uh, binding of the second prong. By contrast, if we have the following situation where the R95G protomer is surrounded now by wild type protomers, this is all ADP state. If we have the green uh, peaks that are associated with isoleucine 189 and 146 uh, in the uh, APO situation, when we add UBXD1, now you can see that the green peaks move to their purple position. So there is motion and therefore there is some binding. It's not wild type binding because we have the gray peaks here, which is the wild type situation, but there's a partial uh, restoration as we would predict, partial restoration of binding by virtue of the fact that there's a partial restoration of the uh, equilibrium. So just to conclude, what we have is a, uh, a series of disease mutants of a large molecular machine these disease mutants vary in severity from a very weak disease uh, causing mutations to very strong disease causing mutations. It can be established on the basis of age of onset or the relative uh, elevation of biochemical markers. From a biophysics perspective, what these disease mutants do is they create an aberrant up-down equilibrium in the ADP state, shifting the equilibrium from what should be all down in a wild type a situation to 
uh, significantly up for very severe disease mutations. We can shift the equilibrium back to the downstate through the uh, addition of revertant mutants or by surrounding an aberrant or a mutant uh, protomer with wild type protomers. In the up situation, there is a problem with binding. Uh, one of the prongs of the binding interaction is going to be uh, eliminated, but that prong can be restored as we restore the equilibrium back to the downstate. So hopefully I've been able to illustrate to you the uh, importance of, I think, NMR as providing really uh, a bridge which connects static structure with uh, biological function. That bridge is going to be functional dynamics. And again, let me uh, uh, reiterate the fact that through the development of very, uh, various uh, physical uh, uh, approaches, we're now able to look at uh, megadalton particles and get a quantitative uh, dynamics information to bridge the gap between uh, structure and function. So let me conclude by acknowledging uh, two uh, former very talented postdocs, uh, Anne and Ray, who were involved in, in all aspects of, of, of the NMR. And Zeb and John are the experts in cryo-EM that we turn to uh, in a collaboration to get out uh, cryo-EM information about the cooperativity, uh, in this case, no cooperativity in the R95G uh, severe disease mutant homohexameric structure. And I thank them and, and, and you for uh, your attention and happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Luis, for this wonderful talk. And we already have a couple of questions. So the first question is by Franz Mulder. Hello, hello, Luis. I can't see you. Can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Oh, great, great. Uh, beautiful, beautiful talk, amazing uh, science. I have, I have a question about your uh, about the ATP. So in many of the slides, when you write ATP, you, you mean ATP gamma S, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's been other systems where states, uh, proteins shuttle between ADP and ATP states, and, and sometimes the ATP non-hydrolyzable analogs are, are actually more ADP-like than ATP-like. So the question is, how do you know or verify that your ATP gamma S state is actually truly similar to an ATP state? Right, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, what we've done is as follows. We've done NMR experiments. The problem with ATP is you have a few hours, but not very much time. So we've done experiments where we can look at ATP and it's an all up situation. Um, you can, um, by the NMR it is. We've also done cryo-EM where ATP is shown to be all up as well. And we've used uh, ATP there. So there's a big difference between ATP and ADP. We've also done uh, experiments where uh, we don't add any nucleotide. Uh, it's APO. And there what we do is we ensure that if we have any ADP in there, we get the ADP out. So we're really dealing with uh, enzymatically, we ensure that. So we're really dealing with an APO situation. And there too, by either NMR and by cryo-EM, uh, the APO form is an up situation as well. So we're pretty confident that the, confident that the up-down equilibrium is faithfully reproduced in the ATP gamma S uh, case. Uh, as it uh, is for ATP and also for APO. But you can get a spectrum of ATP that overlays with the gamma S or? or yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, we can. We just have to do it quickly. Yeah, okay, thanks. We can do cryo-EM because of course we do, we do it at low temperature. You don't have to. Okay, thank you. The next question by Matthew Watson. Matthew, are you still there? Seems Hi, sorry. Uh, hi, Lewis. Um, I was, just, I was uh, impressed with the analysis you did of the 14 um, possible cooperative intermediates, if you like. And I was just wondering how you went about assigning the structures that you observed to those templates. Um, ah, so I should say that uh, I gave a pretty simple, simple explanation uh, for a number yeah. of reasons. I'm not a cryo-EM person. Uh, and so we collaborate with experts. Uh, and the algorithm is actually a very new algorithm that recently appeared in CryoSpark. And this is a principal component analysis algorithm. So what it basically does, 
as far as I understand it, it makes no assumption about 14. It doesn't know whether there's 14 states or 24 states or 1,000 states. You've got your particles. And then basically, it, uh, you have also a structure. The structure you get is the sort of normal structure that you would, you know, the normal way of, of, of generating the structure via cryo-EM. So it's very good at the level of the two donuts, but it's not so good at the level of the NTDs because of course everything is blurred out because some of them are up and down, right? So you have that sure. initial structure and then you say, okay, I have that initial structure. And what I want to do is I want to focus on uh, the NTD region. So I'm going to mask that structure. And I'm going to take a projection of that structure to uh, essentially agree with the projections that I'm looking at, the 300,000 projections, right? Because I know, because I have a structure, I know where every projection comes from. I have Euler angles that define the two-dimensional image in the context of the three-dimensional projection. So therefore, I can go from a three-dimensional structure to a two-dimensional image via these Euler angles. And these, the, the three-dimensional structure is going to be defined to be my nominal structure, which is what I've determined, which has a, does a real good job of D1 and D2, and then a pretty crappy job of the NTDs because it averages. And I'm going to use a principal component analysis to reconstruct the volume element that corresponds to uh, the region of interest, which is the N-terminal domain. So via this principal component analysis where I have, you know, 200, 400, 500,000 uh, particles, because that's the number that I have, and I also symmetry expand the particles because I have sort of pseudo six-fold symmetry. It's not real symmetry, but the, the six-fold expansion actually allows me to get information about every one of the NTDs in a given particle. And from the principal component analysis, I can establish whether the NTDs at every one of the six sites corresponds to an up or a down configuration. Now, once I have that, then I know for every one of my images, you know, which, 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 which of those images are, are, are part of the same three-dimensional entity. Because the images may be, if I have, you know, I have six NTDs, I know, okay, it's up, down, 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 up. So I, I see how many of particles that I have or particle, 2D particle images that, that, that have that situation. And I, you know, and so it's going to be, you know, 10% of my data. And I use that 10% of my data to reconstruct, you know, a, a, a three-dimensional map. And mm -hmm. it turns out that, the four, that, that, that I get 14 three-dimensional maps, as you would predict. And that yep. those three-dimensional maps have the up-down configurations that are only possible, as I showed in the, in the first part of, of, of that slide. So it's, it's really a I way of... That, that we've kind of validated the robustness of the approach. But this is a, an algorithm that was developed by computer science and mathematicians, and I don't claim to be an expert <laughs> in those areas, but uh, it's, it's really impressive how this new algorithm um, was able oh, to- looks, looks brilliant, yeah. Because we tried to do this two years ago and it failed. So yes. this, is, sure. this is all due to computer scientists, and I just benefit from being able to work with smart people. Okay, next question, Laila Girash. Thank you. Laila, can you unmute? I have to unmute two things. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, hey, Louis, great talk as always, and a wonderful dissection of a complicated system. But I suspect the biology is even more complicated. Um, and I was wondering, it seems quite striking that the disease severity relates to the UBXD1N interaction alone. Are there other proteins that use this interface and modulate uh, the action of P97? It, it, is the disease really attributable to that one interaction? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so the answer is um, probably not. P97 is a very busy molecule. It's not just waiting for UBXD1 to knock on its door. There's a whole bunch of you know, P47, P37, and it goes on, adapters. I mean, there's 40 of them. So, uh, you know, I, I think what happens is uh, there are differences in affinities between up and down states. And so uh, one could imagine that if you have these disease mutants, they interfere with uh, that equilibrium. They may increase the affinity of other adapter molecules for that are associated with the upstate. That may mean that there's not enough P97 to do its thing. 
So with respect to UBXD1, say. Um, so, so the answer to your question is, for sure, the biology is much more complicated. Um, for example, we know, as I mentioned in my talk, that uh, you know, the, the particles are not just uh, homo uh, particles. They're mixtures of disease and wild type. How that actually affects things in reality, I don't know. I mean, it, I think it, it depends on, you know, the translation levels of, of you know, transcription levels of, of wild type and, 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 and mutant alleles and how that gets translated into, you know, into relative amounts of protein that gets packaged into P97s is another issue. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of questions that aren't answered, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, the simple kind of approach that we've taken is, is only part of the story. Um, but you so, need it anyway. Wonderful. Yeah. We need biologists, basically. I mean, we, we want to do CRISPR experiments and figure out how much, you know, of each of the uh, alleles is going to be expressed, and then what are these particles actually look like? And what do they look like in, you know, different parts of, you know, different cells in different parts of the body? Okay, we have a question from Hagen Hoffman. Wonderful talk, Louis. Um, I, I may have missed it, but so were all the disease-related mutations on the interface between the NTD and the D1, or are there also mutations, disease-related mutations that are, that are more remote? There are disease mutations that are more remote. Many of them that affect the up-down equilibrium are at the interface. There are some disease mutants that are associated with D1. There's also disease mutants that are associated with D2 that we generally chop off. There's not many of them but there are some that are, are associated with those as well. So they, they tend to be localized uh, either to the interface or to various, uh, there's a linker region that connects the one domain with the next, the, the, the NTD with the D1, the, the circle with the, the gray uh, belly of the protein, uh, if you remember my Right, yeah, yeah, I remember. Slide. But, but, um, but, but many of them in fact do, do localize to uh, the interface. Right. And so, so the remote mutations, do they affect the up and down equilibrium or they, or it's not really clear? Yeah. So we've looked, I think, at a couple of remote mutants and, and, and um, no, uh, I would say. And, and, and interestingly, those that don't, uh, they have various disease uh, pathologies that are somewhat different. Uh, there are ALS-like disease pathologies for this uh, protein, uh, various mutants that are a little bit different. So, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's one um, recipe that basically, uh, you know, answers the, the question. This is really just an interesting biophysical observation that seems to correlate with downstream binding that may, may play a role in, in, in what's going on. See, seemingly, there, there seems to be, uh, you know, a, a plasticity to this molecule. Uh, and if, if, if the only thing that we could learn would be that, you know, if we can figure out uh, uh, some sort of uh, pharmaceutical that could shift the equilibrium, uh, it may be that we could shift binding properties. And that may be useful in, in some cases. Thank you. Okay, Ben. Thank you very much, Louis. It's really incredible how far you've been able to, to push NMR to be able to look at these large complexes in this detail. It's really enormous. Thanks. Um, I have a question regarding time scales. So under all conditions, for all of the variants you showed us, you always remained in fast exchange, which surprises me if for a system we have cooperativity and this size and I was wondering, any signs for, for some variants or some conditions where you you run into slow exchange and the system really gets locked in some state? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's, a, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think we really haven't seen that, although there are multiple time scales. So what I can say is that when we do a class of experiment called the relaxation dispersion experiment, and we try to fit our data to a simple up-down equilibrium, uh, much of the data really doesn't fit that. So we, have, we can fit the data to a three-state uh, equilibrium where we have very fast up-down equilibria that are 15,000 per second or larger. We can only get a, a lower bound because when things get to be too fast, well, that's, 
we, we can't we can't separate time scale then. And we also have other processes that are on the millisecond time scale. Now we don't really know what those processes are, uh, and um, we're not sure. But but certainly you know very rapid uh, time scale motion for the up down uh, uh, equilibria in the complete R ninety five G case. Now of course that is a case where we don't have much or at least the cryo EM data and our interpretation thereof is telling us that we don't have, you know, much in terms of interactions between the individual domains. Uh, we, we haven't done as, we haven't done any analyses where we have an R95G uh, associated with nearest neighbors that are going to be wild type. But it's very clear by virtue of the fact that we see just, you know, one peak, that we have uh, still fast exchange like going on. Now, sometimes it's true that when we, uh, when we poke the protein with another mutation, we can see maybe, you know, a peak that moves, but it moves and forms sort of two peaks, one major and one minor. So what does the minor mean? Um, so there are issues that, uh, you know, are, are, are certainly worthy of further study. I think the dynamics is complicated to say that something is two state up down equilibrium is overly simplistic. That model seems to fit the data reasonably well in terms of chemical shifts. But when we explore fitting of chemical shifts, in addition with millisecond time scale motions, we're left with the fact that there are multiple millisecond time scale motions. It is more complicated than a two state uh, situation. Thank you. Very much. What we would love to be able to do, of course, and we can sort of begin to do that via NMR, is, is trace where the allosteric network is coming from, is rather than just phenomenologically is, you know, saying, okay, when we have this type of arrangement of neighbors, we get this sort of equilibrium. Why is that equilibrium the way it is at the level of interactions, specific atomic resolution interactions that either are present or are not present? So that's something that we really want to uh, explore. So Thank you. is there actually a role for this fast dynamics between the two states? Sorry? Is there a role for the fast dynamics? So I don't understand, is there a what for the fast dynamics? No, I mean, uh, is there any biological role for the fast dynamics? Ah. Or is it just there? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So, you know, if you have the all down, like if you have a wild, if, you know, a wild type situation, well, you're, you're 99% down, so, or 99.9, .9, we say 100%. I, we have to define 100% one way or the other. If, it's, if we have the, the you know, the, the, the all ATP state is all up. So you're, you're, you're biologically, if you're talking about a wild type uh, particle, you're either all down or you're all up. So the dynamics in that sense is, assumes a, a less important role. When you're 50-50, then of course the dynamics is as it would be for a disease mutant. Then the dynamics is is more significant. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess there are no more questions, so uh, we will uh, just finish the lecture here. Thank you very much again for the wonderful talk. My and pleasure. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, in two weeks we have a talk by Martin Grubel, and we hope to see you all in that talk as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.